Thanks so much for being with us today. I wanted to let you know that you can now go out to our website, newdaynw.com, and save your space for next Sunday's in-person gathering on the 24th at the Hub at 10 a.m. And uh, we really do need you to register for that to let us know you'd like to be there uh, since seating is limited. And then once we, we've reached capacity for that service time, we will we'll add a second one as well. We'd love to have you there for that. Also wanted to remind you that every Wednesday night between now and Easter, uh, we're having an in-person midweek prayer gathering at 6.30 p.m. also at the Hub. You don't need to sign up for that one. Just mask up and show up. And, and join us as we really intentionally and purposefully seek the Lord's leading as we're going into this new year. We need him. We need to hear his voice because uh, New Day is facing big challenges, big decisions as we go into uh, 2021. And so uh, come on out for that as well. I am going to pray for us as we uh, go into our time together today. But I was thinking, uh, I was thinking about the passage in the book of Genesis where God creates Adam and, and we're told that he scooped up some of the dust of the earth and he created Adam's body. And then we're told that he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, the breath of life. And then if you jump over to the book of John in the New Testament, right after Jesus rose from the dead, he, he appeared to his disciples and John says that he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. And I don't know about you, but as I'm coming into this week, that, that idea of having God breathe into me the breath of life, that's, that's what I want for this new week. Maybe you feel like you've just been ground down to dust and you're needing to be reformed. Let's just go to him uh, this morning and, and invite him to do that for us. We pray with me? God, we come. And, and we ask that you would quiet our hearts as we enter into this time with you. We come from a week full of intensity and energy and anxiety. And we want to lay all of that down before you, to place it in your care. To see ourselves doing that, just, just setting it down and, and asking you to hang on to it for us. And then, God, in our much deflated lungs, would you just breathe into us your spirit? Fill us back up, God. We are depleted. We are worn down, and we need you. We need you to um, give us your very presence. Your presence is there with us, and we know that, but we pray that you would remind us in a new way. Make us more open to it. God, restore us. I pray that your word, as we take it in today, would be like oxygen. Uh, just, just let us take it in deeply, God, I pray. We give this time to you. We invite you to lead us by your spirit. Show us all you would have. Uh, and, and God, we pray that you would be glorified and honored and lifted up in new ways by our time together. And that you would continue to form Christ in us as we listen to you. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Well, I read probably most of the books in the school library, but I loved The Wind in the Willows by Kenneth Graham. My favorite book right now is Wing to Fire. Hi, my name is Kate Erickson, and one of my favorite books growing up was Green Eggs and Ham by Dr. Seuss. I loved all of Dr. Seuss's books growing up, but this one was my favorite because it was the first book I was able to read all the way through, all by myself. I would read it almost every day, and it would always make me laugh. All the illustrations and all the fun rhymes and all the ways they were trying to make them eat green eggs and ham. My favorite childhood book was this one, The Tortoise and the Hare and the Lion and the Mouse. My favorite book growing up was Amelia Bedelia. My favorite book from childhood was All Creatures Great and Small. I wanted to be James Harriet in Northern Maine. My favorite childhood book is A Little Princess. 
So like most good Canadian children, my favorite book growing up was Anne of Green Gables by Lucy Maud Montgomery, read first to me by my mom, and then many times since by myself, Anne of Green Gables. Well, those are some great choices. My personal favorite from when I was growing up was actually a little bit of a mistake. We had this Christian bookstore in town and my mom took me there one day and I got to pick out a book and I picked out this one with an orange cover and a kind of cool picture on the front and it was called Prince Caspian and took it home. I had never heard of the Chronicles of Narnia before. I didn't know what it was and I didn't realize that this wasn't book one. This wasn't the place to start but I did anyway. I just dove in and uh, that book just got me hooked. I was completely immersed into this universe that C.S. Lewis created. And I can remember sitting and reading it and when I would get done, I would be a little bit disoriented because I had kind of forgotten about all the rest of the world around me. And that really set the bar for future stories and the kind of experience that I wanted when I was reading a, a, a fiction book. Well, today we are coming to a portion of the book of Joshua that is for many people their favorite section, not only of the book of Joshua, but maybe even in the entire Bible. It is much, much loved, and, and you'll see why as we get into it. It's just such a great, great passage. But as we are continuing this study of Joshua, uh, I want to start by reading the verses that we read last week and let that sort of set the stage for where we're going today. Take a look at Joshua chapter 1, starting in verse 1. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses' aid, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now then, you and all these people rise up and cross over the Jordan River into the land I'm about to give to them, to the Israelites. We noted last week that Israel was at this major transition point in their history, not only in terms of leadership with the death of Moses, but also in terms of geography because God is, is transplanting them into a new location where they haven't been before with somebody in charge who hasn't been in charge before. And so everything is going to look and feel different. What, is this, what does this mean for them? Who are they as a people? They're having to re-examine everything and it just feels like there are so many parallels to where New Day is at right now as we are literally without a physical meeting space for everybody. Uh, what does that even look like as we go into 2021? Where will we be six months from now? Uh, we are continuing to seek God's leading through this story of Israel and saying, God, what do you have for us? Who would you have us be uh, to be your salt and light in this community? Well, uh, God continues to reveal more instruction to Joshua in the next verse. Uh, let's take a look. He said, I will give you every place where you set your foot, as I promised Moses. Your territory will extend from the desert, that's down in the south, to Lebanon in the north, and from the great river, the Euphrates in the east, all the Hittite country to the Mediterranean Sea in the west. No one will be able to stand against you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Be strong and courageous because you will lead these people to inherit the land I swore to their ancestors to give them. Be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left that you may be successful wherever you go. Keep this book of the law always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. That last little section especially has been what so many people have considered to be their favorite verses because it resonates in such a powerful way, these thoughts here. And, and I don't know if you caught it, but God repeated that same thought multiple times to Joshua right within this passage where he said, be strong 
and courageous over and over again. He really wants him to get this idea. And it's easy to read a portion of scripture like this and imagine the scenario there and think that it's almost like God is offering some quick last minute instructions before he takes on this, this epic challenge. But in fact, this is not the first time that Joshua has been exposed to these exact words or very similar words to them. When Moses was still alive and he was commissioning Joshua to be the next leader, look at what he said in Deuteronomy chapter 31. Then Moses summoned Joshua and said to him in the presence of all Israel, Be strong and courageous, for you must go with this people into the land that the Lord swore to their ancestors to give them, and you must divide it among them as their inheritance. The Lord himself goes before you and will be with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. In other words, this is not the first time that Joshua has heard this message, be strong and courageous, right? Because over here when he's with Moses, the words that Moses uses are almost identical to what the Lord is telling him as he's getting ready to cross the river. Uh, there's this continuity of the message. It's not like Joshua's getting ready to do this new thing, something that is taking him into the unknown, and that, that God is coming up with some brand new, innovative message that he's never heard before. Instead, God is saying, you've got to remember what you've already learned and been taught. I think that is a really good message for us as we are looking ahead to the future and really seeking to hear from God in a new way. It can be tempting to think that what we really need is something brand new from God when in reality he's already spoken a great deal to us. And sometimes looking back can take us forward. Sometimes paying attention to what has already happened among us, what he's already done, uh, leads us. They did a study of this people group in South America called the Amara people who have this unusual view of time and chronology. You know, for us, we look ahead and we think the future is out in front of us. It's, it's, uh, it's somewhere off in the distance. But for these people, the future is behind them and the past is what's in front of them. Why? Because the past is what they can see. It makes sense, right? We're blind to the future. And, and sometimes that, I think, is a good mentality for us to, to keep in mind that it's our, it's our past that's right there that we can look at. And I think if we can acknowledge it in, in all its, uh, its glory and, and all of its um, brokenness, if we can take it for what it is and pull out the themes and the threads of what God has shown us and spoken to us about, we can begin to understand some meaning out of that and, and to begin to discern what it is that God's been saying and doing among us that will probably inform where he's taking us in the future. So paying attention to history is important. And we can see as we look at Joshua's history that God didn't just even introduce this theme of being strong and courageous just when Moses said the words. He's been working on this in Joshua since the beginning. And I want to look at a few incidents from Joshua's life just to, just to show how this developed. The first time that we meet Joshua is in the book of Exodus in chapter 17. The Israelites have just come under attack by the Amalekites. And Moses turns and says, hey Joshua, go fight these guys. That's the first time we ever even heard there was a Joshua. And suddenly he's embroiled in this battle. And it's not just any battle. This is the one where Moses stood on top of the hill, held out his arm with the staff of God. And as long as he was holding up his arm, the people were winning. But if he lowered it, they would be losing. This is the same staff that he used to part the Red Sea. It is the symbol of God's presence with his people. And this is this important lesson for Joshua right off the bat to see that he can fight all he wants, but he is dependent on God for his strength. You know, so many Christians around the world are engaged in intense battles where they are dependent on the Lord for strength. The uh, organization Open Door just came out with their world watch list for 2021 of the 50 most dangerous places to be a Christian. Did you know that 13 Christians 
die for their faith in Christ every single day. And 309 million Christians are living in places where they are under extreme persecution. And it's gotten worse during COVID because people are, are now confined in home settings with people who are antagonistic to the gospel. And so there are people engaged in these literal fights. And all of us are engaged in a battle of one kind or another where we are learning that we are totally dependent on the strength of the Lord. Well, the next time we see Joshua is when he goes with Moses up to Sinai to get the Ten Commandments. And they spend all those days in God's presence. And God speaks to them his, his own word with his own voice, telling them his will for his people. And, and Joshua would have encountered firsthand the power and the nature of that word. So all that time later, when he's getting ready to cross the Jordan... And God says to him, don't let this out of your mouth. Hang, hang on to this. Meditate on it day and night. Joshua would have been reminded of that first encounter and what that had been like and the, the strength and courage that that had provided for him then. Because they would have needed that even as they were coming down the mountain. Because when they got to the bottom, they discovered that the people were engaged in this horrible idolatry. They had crafted this golden calf and not only that, but Aaron had told them it was this calf that had led them out of Egypt. He was confusing the story and saying that, that this was the same as the real God. And it was all mixed up and muddled and the people were embracing it. And here's Moses and Joshua by themselves having to confront the entire nation about this. Talk about needing strength and courage. And we might think that idolatry is just a topic of the past, not something that really pertains to the people of God today, but I think it's still very much a real and potential threat for us. And even as we look at what we were talking about last week, about what was happening in DC, where, where the name of Jesus was being draped over activity that was clearly not of, of him, it's, it's when we get into that that we start to be in the realm of idolatry. And, and I want to be really clear pastorally right now. I know that it's very easy for people on both sides to be vilifying people for who they voted for. And I want to be really clear that, that we are all voting according to conscience, voting to be in line with our beliefs, and, and we have limited choices. And, and as we seek to, uh, to use the best wisdom God has given us, and then we prayerfully consider it and, and leave the results in his hands. And there are people, good Christian people, voting different ways. But it is when uh, the, the loyalty and allegiance to an individual or an idea supersedes our allegiance to Christ. And we start to engage in attitudes or behavior that are counter to what obedience to Christ looks like, then we need to call it out as something that has crossed the line into idolatry. And I was heartened this week to see that many uh, Christian leaders with national platforms and pastors have begun using that actual word of idolatry. Uh, and there was one pastor in particular who, who was repenting of his own role in in fueling such idolatry, but as he did so, he immediately got uh, this backlash from hundreds of people and death threats from, from Christians even, which, which just um, validated his point that that's exactly what we're talking about, because that is certainly not uh, of the Lord to be, to be responding in that way. And so we do need to be conscious all the time. There are so many things that can pull us away from worshiping the true Christ. And anytime we are putting our, our hope in uh, something else as, as being our salvation uh, or our one true um, hope of, of anything, any good future, then um, that's where we have, we have moved away from him. So that takes a tremendous amount of, of courage and strength to address that. Well, Joshua discovered it was not only with other people that he was needing to be strong and courageous, but even when he was just by himself. 
um, we are told that, that Moses set up this tent of meeting outside of the camp. And, and Joshua had a role in that. Take a look at Exodus chapter 33. It says, The Lord would speak to Moses face to face as one speaks to a friend. Then Moses would return to the camp, but his young aide Joshua, son of Nun, did not leave the tent. There is a life-size replica of the tent of meeting in Israel today where you can go and get a small taste of what it must have been like for Joshua. I think about him, you know, here he is, this, this warrior type, this man of action, now suddenly confined to this small space. And we don't know why that was asked of him to be there, but he, he remained. He chose to stay committed to it and, and spend that extended time alone with God in his presence, and he didn't leave. And so when God says, as he's getting ready to send him into the promised land, I'm never going to leave you, Joshua. Remember that time that you were with me in the tabernacle? Now you're the tabernacle and I'm the one who's going to stay. And if Joshua could relate to his own level of commitment, how much more could he know and count on God with his faithfulness, following through on that promise and never leaving him? There's a tremendous amount of strength and courage that came out of that time of just being alone with God in the temple. The next incident also takes place at the tent of meeting because Moses invited 70 elders out from the camp to come and experience God together there with him. And as they're there together, uh, the spirit of God comes on them and they begin to prophesy, to speak God's word. Well, at the same time, there were two elders who had not come out and joined them. They're back in the camp. Uh, and unexpectedly, the Holy Spirit comes on them as well, and they begin to prophesy. Well, that's highly unusual and unorthodox, and so somebody comes and reports it to Joshua. And Joshua gets all alarmed at this news, and he goes and he tells Moses, and he said, you got to stop these guys. And Moses is like, are, are you jealous for me, or what's going on here? Because I think this is great. He said, I wish everybody could experience this spirit in this way. Moses has all this freedom about God working in other people, and Joshua had to learn to have courage in the face of seeing what God was doing in others. It reminds you of the story of Jesus' disciples when they saw other people uh, casting out demons in Christ's name. And, and they went to Jesus about it. And Jesus said, well, if they're not against me, then they're, they're for me. And there was just this broader sense of God being at work in more ways than we might expect. God is doing more than we think. And we we so often want to have control and limit things and we get all fearful around other people. You know, tomorrow is Martin Luther King Jr. Day and I really liked what he said in one of his speeches. He said, people fail to get along because they fear each other. They fear each other because they don't know each other. They don't know each other because they have not communicated with each other. Can we have the courage to learn to communicate with each other and be curious about what God might be doing in ways that are not what we expect him to. Can we have the courage to allow him to do that work? Because if we can, I think we will also be strengthened by that because then we can receive what it is he's doing through other people. We can enjoy it and enter into it in a way that we can't if we're closed off by fear. So Joshua had to learn that he had to have courage to let God work through other people and not just him and not just Moses. The final incident is when Moses sent Joshua as a spy into the promised land. There were 12 of them that went as spies. And of course, that in and of itself required courage because it was dangerous. It was behind enemy lines and put their lives at risk. Uh, but it was when they came back and gave their report that took true courage because Joshua and Caleb were the odd men out. Everybody else came back and was saying, there is no way we can do this. The people are too powerful. We would just be destroyed. It's impossible. And Joshua and Caleb said, no, no, if God is leading us to this and he's going with us, we can totally do this. We have to do this. Well, now it is 38, 40 years later, and Joshua is actually going to make it happen. But now he's an old man. He doesn't have the same endurance, the same physical strength that he once had. 
maybe not even the same optimism. And God is reminding him again, you need to be strong and courageous because this is going to happen. And now Joshua can look back at all these things we've talked about, this, this lifetime of encounters with God and know that that foundation that has been laid gives him just such utter confidence moving forward into whatever may come, whatever he can't see ahead. He knows now who God is and how he operates in his life, and he can count on that moving forward. And the same is true for us individually and as a church, that we can look at the way God has worked in all the things that we have been through and count on him to be the same as we move forward. I had a chance to talk to my Aunt Jan this week. She lives up in White Center and has been uh, following along with our messages during the pandemic. And she told me a story that I hadn't heard before of her own personal connection to these verses that we've been talking about today. And uh, she said that when she was growing up, you know, it was back in the 50s when uh, schools were doing the war drills and kids would have to get under their desks uh, it was all in fear of some nuclear attack that might come. So there was a lot of uh, stress and trauma around that. And then there had been a house down the street that had burned down. And so she had this inordinate fear of fire and, and the same thing happening to their house. And so every night she would get up out of bed for several years and go downstairs and crawl into bed with my grandparents, her parents, and uh, and do that to fall asleep. And as this was happening over and over again, uh, my grandpa's watching her and seeing, seeing how this is all affecting her personality. And he, he says, you know, what I'm, what I'm seeing doesn't reflect what it looks like to have that personal relationship with Christ and to know that he is present with us because you shouldn't have that, that level of fear that you're having to struggle with. And so he began to ask her if she understood what it meant to know that she had that kind of relationship. And she had always just assumed that because she was in church all the time, she was automatically a Christian. And he explained to her what it meant to, to ask Christ in personally and to invite him and to ask him to forgive your sins and, and to give you his presence to be with you always so you didn't have to be afraid. And so that night she, she did that. She, she prayed and invited him in and she said that there was just such this palpable peace that came over her, just flooded over her in a wave. And she went back upstairs to her own bed and she no longer so desperately needed that physical presence of her parents because she now knew that she had the spiritual presence of her heavenly father with her. And she said she never needed to go down to their bed out of fear again. And, and she said that my, my grandpa gave her those specific verses out of Joshua to be life verses for her. Be, be strong and courageous. Do, do not be afraid. And, and she could point to all the ways that over the last 61 years, God has brought her back to those verses again and again. You know, when each of her three kids encountered near-death experiences and she had to face them with courage. And the fact that she has for the last 23 years been battling a brain tumor and all the recurring bouts of needing to put complete trust in God to a point where, where she can now face her future unafraid. Uh, and it is such a testimony to me. And uh, I'm so grateful. Thank you, Aunt Jan, for being willing for me to share that here today. But... What is it for, for you that you are having to face with strength and courage? You know, one of the things that I love about this, this story about as Joshua is going forward is what it says right there at the start as, he, as he's headed into that land. Um, because God tells him this, I will give you every place where you set your foot, as I promised Moses. I'll give you every place you set your foot. I like the imagery of that. Because so often when I think of the promised land, I think of it as this destination that is out there, the, the vision of the future that is off somewhere far away, and I better figure out the very specific path to get me there. Whereas this idea of everywhere I set my foot being given to me by God, 
uh, has more of a freedom to it. And, and instead of it being land that was promised, it becomes the land of promise because here's the thing, everywhere I set my foot, if God has promised his presence to be with me personally, that he's never going to leave me, then wherever I go, wherever I set my foot, that promise of God's presence goes with me. And so that land of promise begins to expand and expand. And there is uh, just so much greater room for that. And I can see where God is with me wherever I go. And, and I don't have to be quite so caught up and stuck in in deliberating between each step because I can know that as I'm stepping out in faith in him, that he's going with me. And if I need to redirect as I go, he will, he will redirect me. I really like what Isaiah says, whether you turn to the right or to the left, your ears will hear a voice behind you saying, this is the way, walk in it. That's liberating, isn't it? Because it tells me that no matter what our choices are, as we are going along, as we are following the Lord, he's going to continue to direct us. And we don't need to be paralyzed uh, when we, we aren't sure because God will give us the wisdom that we need to make one choice. And then as we are there, then we can make the next choice. This is, this is what we were talking about when we said we are moving the chains forward as we are going. I like what the Spanish poet Antonio Machado said. When he said, wanderer, there is no road. The road is made by walking. The road is made by walking. I like the sense of that line. I think it's mostly true, but it's also partly not true, especially for those of us who have put our faith in Christ because he is the way. He is our, our path forward and our road but not only is he the road, he's also our Joshua. He's the leader out in front of us. And so that means in those times when I am not strong and I'm not courageous, that I can hold on to and count on the fact that Jesus was strong and courageous on my behalf. He willingly and boldly faced that greatest dread of all, that separation from his father, entering into death and pain and injustice all for you and for me so that we could cross over with him into the land of promise to experience all that he has for us by way of freedom, uh, freedom from fear, freedom in our relationships with each other, freedom in our relationship with God. And so my question for you as we, as we wrap up our time together is, first off, do you, do you know that you have that relationship with Christ? Have you, have you asked that question like my Aunt Jan of going, do I, do I really understand that he is with me to free me from all these fears? Uh, and if you don't and you'd like to, it's very simple. It's just a matter of asking and inviting him and saying, Lord Jesus, I need you in my life. Please come in, forgive me. I believe what you did on the cross applies to me and my sin. Uh, fill me with your presence. Give me hope and a future. Free me from my fears. And scripture says that when we pray that, when we invite him in, he comes in and he stays. And if that's your prayer, if that's the first time that you've, you've asked something like that of God and invited him in and started that relationship, I'd love it if you would just email me and tell me because I'd love to be praying for you and send you some verses of encouragement. Um, it's really... A wonderful thing to know that we have his eternal presence with us for the rest of our, our life. Um, and if that's something that you've had that relationship for a while, my question for you is, where are you needing strength and courage right now? Where is it that you are needing to have the courage to forgive somebody maybe, or to say, I'm sorry? or uh, the strength to actually let go of some control and trust God with something, or to, to step out in faith on the next step that you know, even though you might not see the full picture, where are you needing more of his strength and courage? Wherever you step, he says, he'll give you that land. Lord Jesus, 
Thank you that you are our promised land. Thank you that no matter how many promises God has made, they are yes in you. Uh, we are so grateful. Thank you for giving us your presence to help us be strong and courageous. God, these are strange times that are requiring an extra measure of courage in new degrees and new ways than we ever knew. So I pray, pray for each person listening. God, that in the days and weeks ahead, that you will show them not only where you have already been faithful to them in their life up to this point, but that you will give them a new boldness to face undaunted um, new challenges that may lie ahead and to know the assurance that comes from having your personal presence with us always. We love you. We thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.